Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to pick up on the same concept that, that the chairman was just talking about, uh, because it seems to me, and I'm, this question is going to come to you, Mr. Merkel, uh, it seems to me that what we're talking about here is we have price fixing, which is going to result in a massive growth in premium increases, and then a federal subsidy to pay for the premium increases and claim that it reduced the cost to the person using the drugs. You and others have expressed concerns that the enhanced premium subsidies are, as they are structured, are inflationary and shield consumers from pr premium costs and explained that in a recent study that, this, that you've looked at it uh, for from 2014 to 2023, this report found that during that time, provider networks narrowed, the actuarial values of plans decreased, and unsubsidized premiums have rapidly increased, particularly when compared to the employer's market. As you closed your testimony, you said that you had some suggestions or recommendations you hoped you were asked about. I'm going to ask you about them now. What kind of approach should we have so that we don't have the taxpayer subsidizing the fix and actually we find a fix to this solution? What's the cost that the taxpayer is paying on this? Thank you very much for your question, and uh, uh, you are fundamentally correct that the enhanced subsidies do not do anything to improve what I view as the challenge, which is the underlying value of the plan, which nobody is willing to purchase without government assistance. And it has been long studied that the way that the subsidy is structured, which it basically pegs the value to an insurance plan, uh, uh, the um, second lowest cost silver plan in an exchange, and then it caps the contribution that a enrollee must have at their income when these types of structures have been looked at, they have been found to increase the amount of the cost of the underlying product. So. What I have suggested doing, and what um, many uh, have been suggesting, is that we actually take a look at what is driving the low quality of the underlying plans. We've suggested some incremental approaches, not getting rid of the Affordable Care Act, taking a look at risk adjustment. Right now, risk adjustment is overcompensating for certain populations, which makes insurance companies particularly target them with low value plans. The defunding of CSR payments has created a lot of chaos in the market. We, uh, I know that there's been bipartisan interest in refunding those and that would rationalize the market. And I also think that there is a opportunity for increasing the amount of people, frankly, in the individual market through ways that are not just papering over the low value of plans with more and more subsidies. There was a reform by the Trump administration called the Individual Health Coverage HRA. Um, it's a health reimbursement arrangement that would allow employers to help fund people get coverage in the individual market this would expand the amount of people that are purchasing health care in the individual market. And importantly, insurers would be targeting health care plans to these new enrollees uh, that I don't provide mean to, value. I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to have a question for Ms. Sure. Axelson here, too. Uh, but b before I go to her, tell me the 10-year the, the figure for this subsidy that we are talking about. Do you know it? The 10-year figure is $415 billion. That's what I thought. Ms. Axelson, Axelson, Axelson. <laughs> a recent Magnolia Market Access survey found that because of the IRA's benefit redesign, sizable majorities of Part D plans intend to exclude more medications, including breakthroughs, from coverage, as well as to ramp up the use of prior authorization and step therapy. Uh, in an article you published earlier this summer, you anticipated many of these trends. 
pointing to narrower coverage, higher out-of-pocket costs for some enrollees as likely outcomes of the IRA triggered design changes. You went through some really good recommendations in your testimony. We don't have time right now for you to go through all of those, but what steps could you just quickly identify that Congress and CMS should take to ensure meaningful formulary oversight, especially since the drugs, since drugs have been excluded from the prior authorization rule that was finished earlier this year? Thank you. Uh, first of all, being on formulary, requiring that a drug is on formulary does not mean that there can't be a number of other hurdles placed before the patient, including having to take another drug that they may have already failed on in a prior year uh, to demonstrate that they need the drug their doctor has prescribed for them. So to, to observe the formulary access is not sufficient. It's also to observe whether the plans are requiring non-clinically recommended um, prior authorizations or step edits to get the drug that a person needs. Also leveraging the data that goes back several years. A patient should not have to prove every year, reprove that this is the right drug for them. Formularies have narrowed over time uh, for a number of therapeutic areas, both in the protected classes and the non-protected classes. So again, it's observing trends over time and ensuring that the drugs people need are there for them. Just because a drug works well on average doesn't mean that it works well for every person. CMS has a rich trove of data and can see which therapeutic classes are the ones where people tend to have to try multiple different drugs before they get the one that's right for them. I'm sorry, and I'm going to have to, because my time is, is thank out, you. I'm going to have to ask you to f please fill out the rest of that answer in your response to some of our written questions. Thank you. <laughs> 